Hey, uh, so hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming. My name is Mike Tregalis, and today I'm going to be introducing you to something brand new called Onyx and talking about distributed workflows for dynamic systems. Uh, so first of all, who am I? Um, I'm an independent consultant from the Seattle area. I focus mainly on functional programming, closure, and building distributed systems. If you'd like to work with me, definitely come talk to me after. Uh, I'd love to get in touch with you. So uh, Onyx is something that I've been working on for the last uh, year of my career independently. And uh, fundamentally what it is is a new kind of distributed computation platform. And it focuses on providing an information model to developers where APIs and DSLs are currently dominating. I wanted to completely reimagine what distributed applications could look like. And the result that I came up with is a distinct inversion of control that effectively moves power normally only possessed by framework level constructs directly into applications. And as a result, Onyx is able to compete in both a batch and a streaming space. Uh, it's also useful for doing data ingestion and things like uh, ETL or storage medium transfer. And its architecture is driven by the fact that our data centers look quite different than they did about 10 years ago. Uh, so some of the goals that I had in mind when I started building this uh, was mostly started by my contention that uh, contemporary distributed computation frameworks are monolithic and that with some very careful cutting we can come away with a solution uh, that is back to simple functions and uh, data structures. And using those materials we're able to build much larger and more dynamic systems than we can right now. Environment wise I'm specifically targeting closure in the JVM. Uh, I definitely don't need to tell this room uh, how awesome Clojure is, but you're going to find that AP, uh, Onyx's API has blossomed in such a way that it's reflective of the decisions that Clojure encourages you to make as you get closer and closer to the programming language. Um, so as I alluded to, Onyx is both a batch and a streaming hybrid and supports transparent code reuse between these two things. Uh, we see that people really like this with things like Apache Spark and Summingbird, and while it's really, really hard to actually do this well, um, it, it's totally worth it because it gives you a whole different set of designs that you can employ to defend specifically against human fault tolerance, uh, similar to the Lambda architecture. There are three things in the API that I really wanted by the time I was done. Uh, and the first is how we route data around the cluster. So where we previously had uh, message acknowledgement, moving data from node to node, uh, in Onyx we have first class transactions. So that's, that's a level of abstraction that you're able to work with as you're building your distributed application. The extensibility API is quite powerful and unique in that it employs multiple levels of dispatch uh, per API endpoint and has priority merging. And in practice, this allows uh, people with different concerns like framework authors and plugin authors and application developers to all move in different directions and not step on each other's feet. Uh, and finally, there is a set of APIs specifically dedicated to side effects in state. Um, I have seen so many code bases ruined over the years due to lack of attention to this detail. Uh, if you guys all do closure, I'm sure everyone has a dynamic war story. Uh, that it just it gets nasty really fast. Um, and so we head that off uh, by just making it part of what you do. So in this talk, I'm, I'm going to discuss the problem space that led me to build Onyx. Uh, I'm going to talk about the underlying information model and the APIs that it exposes talk a little bit about the architecture and what a cloud deployment, deployment ends up looking like, uh, and then I'll show some code in the REPL to show you what the development experience looks like. If we look at what distributed computation in a very simple sense means for application developers, it's kind of about taking uh, data in disparate uh, storage mediums as input, uh, running them through a set of transformations, an arbitrary set of transformations, and then just shoving that data into a set of uh, arbitrary output storage mediums. And granted, that's a very, very simple description, but at the end of the day, that's what we're, we're kind of trying to accomplish. And we do this really well at you know, petabyte scale with techniques like MapReduce. We, we totally have this down. Uh, but what we don't have down so well is, is what happens when that directed acyclic graph, or workflow as I like to refer to it, uh, it cannot be known at compile time. It's often not a static thing anymore. Uh, I see you know, plenty of clients that uh, require a solution uh, where this, this sort of workflow is going to end up being built up by an end user. We, we have end users building these like, Hadoop jobs up through like, drop down boxes and radio buttons on a web application and then they need to be transformed down into a, a program that's going to run out on a cluster. And, and you can't know what these things are going to look like at compile time. And, and so we see everything getting farther and farther away. And this includes what the specifications of our distributed computations are going to look like. And that leads me to assert that uh, the specifications, like what the computation actually is and not how it's accomplished, 
has to have very, four very fundamental uh, characteristics to handle this growing gap better. Uh, and the first is that these specifications need to be agnostic to language. It's like I said, these things need to be able to reach the browser because typically across all different kinds of domains we have uh, end users who are configuring what these workflows are ultimately going to look like. We need to be able to take these specifications and put them on a wire because presumably your web server is not going to be on the same node uh, as one of your cluster members and, and by its distributed activity, of course it can't. Uh, they need to be temporally agnostic. It's also often not the case that we uh, immediately realize what this uh, computation is going to look like uh, out on the cluster. We might put it onto durable storage for a week or for a month and then only, only then realize what it actually is. And finally, they need to be tolerant to machine generation. And this is what Rich is always talking about when he says uh, we need to have good machine interfaces. We're, we're building larger and larger stuff now and our programs need to be better to talking to other programs and not humans first. The human interface comes on top of the machine interface. Otherwise, if you do it backwards, it, it gets really ugly. If we look at what kinds of modern tooling we can, we can pull out to deal with these problems, uh, the first one that I started dealing with was cascading, which is a Java MapReduce framework on top of Hadoop. Uh, and cascading is kind of about having uh, a class per operation that you can do instantiating these operations and then chaining them together through the constructors to form an implicit flow of, of how your, your data is running through your system. And, and it works well enough. Lots of people use cascading. Uh, but if we look at the four characteristics that I care about, we missed out on the first three. Because clearly, this is Java. We're not transcending out of the language. Uh, you're not going to take this code very easily and put it on a wire without some intermediate transformation. You're certainly not going to put this in a database very easily. Uh, I will give you machine tolerance in that maybe you can use some sort of uh, builder pattern to, to work up your computation, but it ends up not being that pretty anyway. Uh, and I don't particularly mean to beat up on cascading because, uh, you know, like I said, it works well enough and we use it, uh, but it was the first one that I used and I realized that something was really, really wrong. Uh, so I want to take a deeper look at what this code is actually doing. And I don't mean the inputs and the outputs to this, this code. I'm talking about what it fundamentally concerns itself with because that's how you end up getting towards simpler solutions. So after a, a long amount of analysis about what this technique actually does, I can tell you uh, that it's at least doing the following. You're at least specifying the mechanics of how your computation is going to be carried out. You're saying how you're going to end up doing this out via your, your framework. And that's fair enough. You're allowed to do that. Where it starts to get sticky is that you're also specifying the structure here. Like I said, the technique is to, to instantiate uh, an operation and then pass it down through the constructors of its uh, subsequent uh, objects in, in your program. And when you combine these two things together, that's where it starts to go awry. But it kind of keeps going in that uh, configuration also takes place in the same, same paradigm. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with trying to conf uh, configure the smaller components of what you're working with, but you end up binding uh, the decision uh, of how you want to configure these things all in the same timeline. You're going from top to bottom and all your choices have to be along that same timeline. What we want to do is take independent choices and put them on independent timelines. Or better yet, just kick time out of the equation. It's a core tenant of functional programming. Get time out of here. And this does the exact opposite. It's also the same thing with uh, forcing concrete classes. You're, you're forced to give up your ability to work in terms of interfaces because you have to pick what concrete class is going to underlie uh, the, the dependent of what you're using. And again, it's, it's almost unfair in saying you have to pick a concrete class, of course. But does it have to be on the same timeline as everything else? Is that convenient for you? Often for me it wasn't and it was, it was very frustrating. And by the time you've built up this computation, by chaining everything together, what you get back is a black box. <laughs> this is a baked object that you're not going to retroactively uh, ask about its composition and try to reason about what you've just you know, built. Um, unfortunately, you can't even jump into one of the middle of these things and then change it and get a new workflow. It's not like persistent data structures. It's this mutable in-place thing. Um, and perhaps worst of all, and certainly most subtle of all for me, I didn't get this for at least nine months of using this framework, was that you're implicitly accruing state with this kind of technique. And it's not even that like you're, you're uh, in this example, it's reusing the same object and mutating it in place. You could use different objects. The, the thing that burns is that you see on line three towards the end with the new regex filter, you're assigning identity to manners of expression. And if you think about it, that's kind of crazy because you're, you're parameterizing this thing with that regular expression. 
and suddenly you care about its identity. And when you have to care about identity from a distance, it hurts a great deal. An identity-based approach is not the way to handle a very dynamic system. You need a values-based approach to be able to do that. And I think that we've kind of become infatuated with how short we can write these programs. Right? We're seeing like, oh, I could do map or, do, or, or word count in like five lines. And we know that um, you know, line length is, is an empty promise in terms of you know, faster schedule, smaller budget, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think what we need to do is to, to unify the power of functional programming with the configuration constructs necessary to tune high volume fault tolerant applications. Oh, my Wi-Fi may have gone out. I was about to open source it. Oh, there we go. Uh, and you know, I, <laughs> There we go. Going to have to change my password. <laughs> OK. There it is. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but my point while trying to do this you know, simultaneously it was real. We need to be able to bring what we have in functional programming uh, to the, the ability to be able to talk about the fact that we are on a cluster and we do need to tune these things. We can't, we can't pretend like it doesn't exist. Uh, and so another thing that we might look at is storm. And I think that storm gets, gets quite closer uh, to, to what we're looking for, but it still misses out a little bit. We see the use of closure data structures here with the maps and the topology and the keywords, and it's getting better. Uh, but you still see these spout and bolt spec functions or macros, and at the end of the day that ends up hurting your ability uh, to be able to talk more generally and transcend out of closure. So this, this also doesn't do it for me. Uh, finally, you might pick up Cascalog. Um, and what I'm going to say is at least true of Cascalog 1, where the API was predominantly macro-based. Uh, when you use macros for an approach like this, you give up all of these characteristics. While there are a lot of great qualities to macros, runtime programmatic generation is not one of them. So again, I, I, can't, I can't do what I want to do with this kind of system. So as I said, uh, the things that I've been working with uh, since I started getting into distributed systems are kind of monolithic, and that uh, with really careful thinking, you can come away with at least six orthogonal things. Uh, and I'm going to take you through how Onyx uses these six things in a very straightforward example. So we're going to pretend that we're ingesting some input records of just two fields, a name and an age. And as output, uh, we're going to transform these things into just uppercase names and ages. Uh, and forgive the simplicity, so you could, you could pretend like we're doing this at like terabyte or petabyte scale, whatever makes you feel like this is worthwhile. <laughs> uh, so, so the first thing that I want to talk about that we pull out from, from the mud ball is, is data representation. And what I mean is when I say how we declare the names of values from a function to another function. Because presumably you're not going to be in the same address space since you're out on a, on a cluster. And the typical way that we see this is by representing it as tuples and fields. And these are ordered explicit sequences of values. So this is storm here towards the bottom using its uh, closure DSL. We declare the output field with a vector. And I hard coded the output tuple here just for clarity. Uh, and you see that we use two vectors and positionally line them up. Uh, so my problem here is twofold. The first is that we've introduced ordering where ordering doesn't need to be. Since you have those names and you can actually see that alignment yourself, there's no reason to impose that incidental complexity of ordering uh, in, that, in that usage. And the second is actually much more deadly in terms of modifiability. Because if you consider the fact, if I want to change uh, name to first name, what does that mean for the intermediaries, for anyone who doesn't care about that name but still needs to pass it along? They all need to care and propagate that change throughout the code. Right? And this is really, really hard to change your programs when you want to do that. Um, and I think there's, like, there's an easy way out. And I don't understand why we don't see this more. Uh, and it's just, it's just to use maps. Um, in Onyx, these are called segments. Uh, they have a specific name for a reason, but I'm not playing a trick on you or anything or introducing some more abstraction. It's actually just a closure map. There's no notion of ordering. You don't have to explicitly declare anything since you can just uh, associate onto these things. Intermediaries don't have to care. And so we get back to two things that, that were hurting me in the past. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is functions. And <laughs> I was almost embarrassed to write this slide because it's, it's so darn simple. Uh, ex expression in Onyx are, are plain closure functions. Uh, there are no macros. There's no state that needs to be around. There's no dynamic scoping. Uh, as inputs, they take a single segment, a map, and they output a segment or a seek of segments. And this is the function that I want to run at scale. This is the materials that I need to have in order to, to work with really dynamic and, and simple systems. 
I know you're all thinking it because we were just there. Uh, can we use transducers? And the answer is yes, uh, at least if you're willing to use an edge build. Uh, if you configure, configure uh, your application as such, you can indicate that you're having a function that returns a transducer, uh, and you can use that to process a sequence of segments. So now you can take your uh, transducer, use it on core collections, use it on core async, and then bring it over to Onyx Unchanged, and you're good to go. The next thing that we take out is positional representation. And this is the really critical thing to, to pull out because it, it's really hard to see why it's there. Um, and when I say positional representation, I'm talking about the order that data is flowing through your system. Pictorially, our, our example looks like that. I like to think of that as a directed acyclic graph or particularly a tree. Uh, I think those constructs are easy to reason about where your data is actually going. And I like trees specifically because Clojure has a good construct for that. And that's just a map because maps are actually just trees. Uh, you can have as many roots as you want, and they can, they can branch out arbitrarily uh, wide and deep. And they are maps of keywords, where the keywords are corresponding one to one uh, to the nodes in the, in the graph. Uh, it's a little bit more obvious if you have a more branchy tree. And again, you can just go as wide and deep as you want. And when you have this representation of strict structure, that's all it's saying uh, of what your computation is, how it's going to flow, uh, you get back all four of these characteristics. Because maps transcend language, no problem. Uh, you can put them on a wire or in a database all day, and they're great for working with uh, other programs. But now, I have these three things. I have uh, data representation. I have functions. Um, and I, I'm not tying all, all these things together. And that, that's where the job of the catalog comes in. And it's, it's strictly for conveying what the workflow is actually you know, trying to express to actual functions uh, down the stack. And this is easiest to see via an example. So if we have the workflow that we just looked at, here's what a corresponding catalog is going to look like. It's a bigger data structure. Uh, you know, don't, don't be too scared, though. It's like quite like a datomic schema uh, in that it has entries per, per uh, task in the workflow. And you can see that uh, each of these, these uh, tasks are corresponding one to one here via the, the name key. Though what I want to drill down on is, is the second one, which has an FN key. And, and that FN key is used for runtime resolution of what your workflow is actually going to be doing. So unsurprisingly, that's going to point towards uh, a fully qualified namespace function on your class path that's presumably there at runtime. And that's just the function that we were working with before. We don't have to use any kind of crazy macros to figure it out. We can just use resolve and closure. And when you have those things, it's very easy to mentally complete the circle for what's happening. You take the function, and you reason about which one it is through the catalog, and then you can mentally substitute it back into the workflow, and you have that ring going on. And, and this is kind of it. I mean, there's, there's boilerplate code to hook everything together. But as promised, at the end of the day, the guts of your program are going to be data structures and functions. And these are the materials that I think are going to push forward to building really much more dynamic systems. Notice that there's not even like an Onyx API call here going on. There's, there's Onyx slash keys or whatever, but you don't you know, need to have it on your, your Linegan project to, to be able to work with these just very basic materials. Uh, so I think that's, that's a good step forward. Uh, but this is not a toy, and I, I actually built it to solve real problems. So its extensibility model needs to let you go further than that. Uh, and I'm talking about extensibility in two notions, the first of which I want to override things that I don't like. And the second that's harder to capture is a, is a matter of composability. And that's augmenting things that are already working for you, but you want to come on top of them and then change them a little bit. Specifically here, I'm talking about reaching new storage mediums, uh, which is always kind of tricky for these frameworks, depending on how they're, they're working under the hood. It's, it's, not, it's not always the easiest thing to actually do. Um, and quite ambitiously, I want to see if we can do it with little or no code change uh, to the actual application. So in Onyx, we have something called a plugin, which is a method of, of adapting through the catalog. Again, an example is the easiest thing to see. This is the same catalog that we looked at before. And here's the same workflow that, that pairs with it. And we see here that the identity up top on the first one is mem slash read segments. That's a plugin for reading segments out of memory so that you can do development. Let's say it's time to go to production, and we're actually going to be reading segments out of Kafka. The changes are, are quite small, in fact. Um, what you do is you, you get rid of that catalog entry and you know, pretend it's not there using sequence functions or whatever have you. And you, you bring in a new catalog entry. Um, and this one's parameterized for Kafka. It's saying Kafka topic, here's my topic, here's my zookeeper, and everything that you need to know. And this presumes that you have the Kafka plugin on your class path already. 
But now all you need to do is reassociate that in keyword back to this new catalog entry because they're sharing that name. Right? And, and again, this is kind of it because we're able to push so much of this into data structures uh, that you don't need to change very much else in your application, provided that the shape of your segments, the keys, uh, um, are going to actually look the same. And otherwise, you're, you're done. Uh, and it's very pleasant to work with these things because you can go from proprietary inputs mechanically over to in memory uh, plugins so that you can diagnose problems locally on your box with very little changes to your application. Just to show you how far you can take this, though, uh, I've been you know, taking common use cases and just like spinning them on their heads because you have, you have this newfound coordination ability to, to do things that were a little bit more difficult before. And this is kind of my favorite example. So suppose you had a Datomic database and you had five different peers running five different queries. This is the way Datomic is advertised to work because of the way that read uh, and query scale. But you can also do something that we don't talk about very much, and there's really no reason why you can't. Take the same query and run it over five different peers. There's three things that I can think of that are interesting that are happening here. The first is that you can now take result sets that couldn't fit in the memory of a single peer and then uh, cast them across all these peers because now you have the, the result set divided by five if you're able to, to divide up your query that way. Uh, the second is that you're able to stream your result set because now they're coming back in, uh, in units of, of, or rather five different uh, units of, of the the query result. You don't have to wait for the whole thing to finish. Um, and, and yeah, uh, so when you have those things, uh, you're, you're able to go a little bit uh, in a different direction. So if you think about how you can actually do this, uh, it's, it's not that hard. You don't need Onyx to do it. Uh, you can reason that these peers are actually querying the, an index, perhaps the EAVT raw datums index, which has all the datums in the database. We also know that this index is totally ordered from 0 to n. And since we know the number of peers and we know the total number of, of datums in the index, what you can do is evenly partition the index such that each peer is now querying local to a specific chunk of index. And this minimizes the surface area of the database that you're now querying. Your query is going to finish faster. And to be able to get a final answer, you just take the results and put them back onto durable storage if your answer is large enough that it wasn't going to fit in the memory of a single peer to begin with. And like I said, you can do this. Uh, it, it takes a fair bit of coordination to, to get right. Um, but it's, it's essentially like doing a batch computation over your Datomic database. Uh, so I wrote a Datomic plugin for Onyx to be able to uh, ingest and write data to and from Datomic. Uh, and, and the same operation looks quite like this. Your workflow is going to be uh, just as before. You're going to partition the index. You're going to do a broad read and read in all the datums in parallel into Onyx. And you're going to run your query, and you're going to persist all the results back together. And if you look at the two entries in the catalog that I'm, I'm interested in, which are uh, you know, partitioning the first part, uh, you see that you parameterize it with a DB URI and a T value so that all nodes in, the, in the, the cluster are actually looking at the same database at a particular instance of time. And, and same goes for uh, the parallel read. You can copy these things out of uh, the, the plugin in README. It's kind of like Chef in that you have the base and then you parameterize the attributes in such a way that's whatever works for you. Uh, and as the application developer, what you care about is this, this query function. And that might resolve to something like this. You're going to get a segment with key datums inside of it. And now all you need to do is run your, your, your datomic query uh, against this datums uh, persistent data structure, because you don't need the database around to do that kind of query. Uh, datomic queries work just as well against persistent data structures as they do databases. Now, you can't do all queries like this. But for certain queries that do need to see all the data, this is totally feasible, uh, and it's, it's very interesting to do it this way um, because there's, there's so little code actually required to get this thing running right now. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, the state API. And you know, we've learned that programs need to have side effects. We're not going to ignore it. Um, we need database connections. We need file handles. We need uh, connections to web sockets, et cetera, et cetera. And if you worked in a sufficiently large code base, excuse me, um, you'll find that using def and def once for top-level side effects in state management is a really bad idea. Uh, it gets out of hand quite quickly and, and makes development uh, very tough to move forward. So in, in Onyx, we have something known as, as life cycles, which are managed uh, ranges of setup and, and teardown of state. It's somewhat similar to Stuart Sierra's component uh, framework, it, though it goes in a different direction. But I do think that things like uh, Component, which is like a lightweight dependency injection uh, framework, are, are a good idea for what we have now. Because 
trying to manage this yourself at the top level is, is totally not the way to go. So there are five endpoints uh, in the uh, state API, and I care about the ones that kind of pair together. So uh, inject lifecycle and close lifecycle are two endpoints that are invoked on your behalf when a task hits a node in your cluster. So that's when you would uh, create something expensive, like uh, a SQL database connection. And you can hang on to that once, and when the task is finished on the node in your cluster, you can clean up after yourself. More granularly, on a per transaction basis, uh, you're able to do something just before you commit the transaction, like uh, log a line or uh, submit some ret metrics to a monitoring server. And then uh, after commit, you can again clean up. So this is useful for having that set up and teardown at, at known points in time. And you don't have to do it at the top level. Again, easiest to see by example. We have a catalog entry. It doesn't really matter quite what it does. What I'm interested in is this custom parameter, myparam42. And so you can use, you can use these uh, multi-methods to uh, dispatch yourself into them. And we notice that the identity is what actually gets called there. There are four different ways to dispatch into the, the def method. And we also see that it returns a map. And that's what that priority merge thing that I was talking about uh, is all about. You're able to take these maps, and then they're merged back together in a particular priority so that you can override things that you didn't really like or take something that already happened and, and augment it even further with like a decorator sort of thing in mind. So we're able to get a hold of that parameter now via the second argument uh, in that function. Uh, and that has lots of keys in it, and you can have full visibility into what's going on. Um, and via that map, we return the next key. So if you want to do something after every transaction, you'd use close temporal, uh, which again, you have that key that you created. It's like a context map. You can now access it down below. And you get, you get this range of motion throughout uh, the transaction that's running ac across your, uh, your program. And you have the ability to do things at certain points in time. Uh, I wanted to talk about the architecture quite quickly. But it's, it's really not all that interesting because of how similar to Storm it is, to be honest. Uh, at the right, we see a set of peer nodes that do the heavy lifting in the actual uh, distributed activity. Uh, I took a very traditional play, and I used Zookeeper, somewhat because I'm afraid of Kyle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and that's just, just your normal setup. We're using that for coordination. Uh, to the left, there's a single coordination node uh, that is, you can only have one of them. Uh, it's like Hadoop's name node. But it is uh, made fault tolerant through durable logging uh, and a heartbeat mechanism. So if your coordinator kicks the bucket, you can have uh, secondary coordinator standing by, ready to take back over. The interesting thing here is that I chose Hornet queue, uh, and specifically a cluster of Hornet queues. Uh, and I did that because uh, I, when trying to pick a queuing mechanism, uh, Hornet queue is standing out as quite performant. Uh, I'm told through benchmarks, I haven't been able to reproduce quite these stats yet, uh, that a well-tuned Hornet queue cluster can push into millions of messages per second per node. Uh, and that's the kind of performance that I would like to hit. Uh, and you might say, but wait, we tried queue-based architectures in like 2004, and it sucked. It was so slow. And that was true back then. Uh, but now, network speeds are significantly faster. We have 10 gigabit plus switches at commodity cost in our data centers. And uh, some great research out of Berkeley shows that disk locality inside your data center doesn't matter anymore. We had that whole notion of uh, move the code to the data in Hadoop, uh, because moving the data would just have been a disaster. Um, but don't impose that constraint on yourself anymore. You can have these fast switches uh, and, uh, and not care. There are other problems to worry about. OK, so just a quick demo. Uh, I want to show what the full example looks like that we were running. Uh, and so this is, this is the Linegan project, and it has a couple of dependencies. Onyx itself, uh, Core Async, and the Datomic plugin, or rather the Core Async plugin. Um, Uh, so it's, it's just a single file. And I wanted to just show the whole thing beginning to end. Uh, it's quite similar to how you run it locally to how you run it in a cloud. The only thing you have to do is change the mechanism by which you connect to the coordinator. Uh, so you're going to evaluate your namespace. And that works fine. I'll just evaluate line by line in the REPL as I go. Uh, the workflow looks exactly the same. We have that map via keyword input uh, through, through the, the transformation and into the output. We also have the catalog. And the thing that's different about the catalog is that we're now using Core Async for input and output. I actually ended up chucking the idea of an in-memory plugin via, uh, for Core Async. Uh, there's really no reason to use Atoms or, or whatever to try and do this locally. Core Async works just as well. Uh, and then you see that the identity here is Core Async read from Chan and, and similarly write from Chan. And these are straight out of the plugin for how you use it. 
So eval that. Uh, and eval uh, the function that we've been working with. Again, it's, it's just a plain function. There's nothing surrounding it. You get a map and you return a map. Uh, easy enough. The, the key distinction here now is that for Onyx to understand where it's getting its input from and how to write it back out, it needs to actually have a reference to these channels. Uh, and so you use the state API to inject these channels inside of it. And you might notice that I'm defing these things at the top level, which is what I just said not to do. Uh, but for just convenience of demo, uh, I didn't want to wrap them in anything else. Uh, so again, we inject these in. We use an ID to connect the coordinator to its peers. Uh, Onyx is different from Hadoop and Storm in that it doesn't do jar deployment for you. I think we've been doing that since 2004, and I, I really don't think that's the best way to go anymore. We have tools like Chef and Puffet and whatever, uh, and I really am not convinced that we don't have a better way to do these things. Uh, so while, while it now is on the user to get your jar across the cluster and use a, an identifier to hook these two things up, I don't think we're going to fail at this. I think we're just going to find something better. Uh, and as a result, you can also have a rolling restart because you can just spin up your jar and use that identifier to connect right out to the coordinator. Uh, you don't need to have uh, the homogeneous jar across the cluster, which isn't always the convenient thing to do if you're working in certain kinds of systems. So now we have two sets of, of uh, options, one for the, the coordinator and one for the peers. Uh, like I said, they use uh, Hornet Q and Zookeeper, but you don't need either of these things to start developing because you can use in-memory modes uh, for both of these. So you can just clone this repository, and as long as you have Lining it in Java, you're, you're good to go. So connect the coordinator to its peers, and it returns. Uh, and here's my, my data. I have a set of maps here, uh, just as before, with some additional names. And I also have this keyword done here. Uh, let's see how I'm doing on time. This is the mechanism by which uh, batch in streaming mode is, is switched between at runtime. It's a really simplistic thing to do, but it actually it works just fine. It just lets Onyx know you're done with your input stream. It's effectively a batch mode. You can go and do something else now, uh, and, and that ends up working fine enough. So eval and put those onto the channel. Close the chan. Uh, start up the peers. Submit the job. And then we're just going to collect the results and then print them back out. And you see that all the names are now uppercased and all of the ages are incremented by one. It's a lot of boilerplate code, like I said, and there's no reason why you can't minimize this, but this is you know, the, the full thing. And then you could just shut everything down. Uh, you get a log here on the left. It's, it's quite chatty, and I plan to calm it down uh, once people start maybe adopting this. Uh, but going for maximum visibility, you get to see an awful lot of what's going on. OK, uh, I went faster than I thought I would have. Uh, so that's actually all I had, and I just wanted to thank CircleCI for providing build resources. Uh, that was awesome. And a consultancy called Infinite Cloud uh, for funding performance testing. That was super, super helpful. Um, so can I take any questions? I can't shake the thought that I just exposed my password for GitHub. Uh, that was running in my head the whole time. Uh, I've certainly been hacked by now. The repository's gone. Um, yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, what sort of uh, message reliability guarantees and semantics does Onyx provide? Like, at most once, at least once? It pushes all of that down to Hornet Q. And from uh, what I've discovered, uh, Hornet Q does at least once, and that's how it actually provides transactions. Uh, so I'm, I'm leaning on that very, very hard. So if you go and read how the Hornet Q documentation handles all those things, it's exactly that. Yep. Uh, sure. So the question was, uh, so if you have stateful data, how do you partition it? So uh, can you say that one more time? No, I was trying to repeat the question for the, for the yeah. So if you have stateful data, how do you partition it for? Mm. Yep. So how do you do like grouping and aggregation? Yeah. yeah you notice that in that transformation uh, catalog entry, there was a key that said transformer. There's also grouper and aggregator. And those are the only three things that I have right now, because I can't really think of anything else that I want to add. And those have different semantics in that uh, if you return um, uh, just to, uh, anything you want from the, the grouping function, that's effectively how you end up splitting on, on that value. And even that shells out to Hornet Q, because Hornet Q provides uh, those grouping semantics. Uh, and then the aggregation nodes will just be pinned with those same values every single time. What if you have a case where you have multiple input streams, one for one 
Yeah, uh, so the question was, what if you have multiple input streams that want to converge on the same transformer? What I plan to do soon is that uh, be able to have a set of keywords instead of just a single keyword to support that. Right now it's a little annoying in that you have to duplicate your, your keyword across the tree. Uh, but it also works you know, reasonably for now. OK. Oh, sure. If you wanted to do something like a, a join, uh, say a window join of uh, two streams, would you need to do the state bookkeeping for that yourself or something? Yes. So yeah, if you wanted to do uh, join two streams, you'd have to actually do the, the, the coordination yourself right now. OK, I'm going to go change my password. Uh, <laughs> thank you, guys.